So good morning and thank you for joining us for the JMM and Peak Asset Management Nuclear Energy Forum. I'm Jane Morgan and today I'm joined by Nib Dagan, the Executive Director of Peak Asset Management. So today you'll be hearing from Senior Energy Analyst at Regal Funds Management, James Hood, the Managing Director and CEO of Energy Elements, Caroline Keats, Executive Chairman of Terra Uranium, Andrew Vigar, and Managing Director and CEO of Elevate Uranium, Murray Hill. If you'd like to ask a question throughout today's presentation, please use the Q&A function, which can be found at the bottom of your screen. Niv, I'll hand over to you. Thanks everyone and uh, Jane for hosting. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Niv Dagan, Executive Director of Peak Asset Management. And today I'll kick off the discussions with an overview of the uranium and nuclear sector by Regal Senior Energy Analyst, James Hood. Uh, James, good morning. Uh, I want to start off by getting your views on the space and how you think uh, about the investment in the sector. Firstly, uh, we have seen a lot of changes in the sentiment uh, towards the uranium sector and nuclear energy over the past year. Um, can you please elaborate um, what's driven this? Good morning, Niv, and uh, good morning, everyone on the call. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak on the panel. Um, very much look forward to it. So um, just maybe before I answer your question directly, Niv, I'll just give 10 seconds of context. Um, my name is James Hood. I'm with uh, Regal Funds Management, and I handle all of our energy supply chain investments. That includes both traditional energy and energy transition investments. We've got around five and a half billion uh, Aussie dollars farm under management with leverage on top of that. And most of our strategies are long, short, listed equity based strategies. So um, yeah, that's that's the context. Maybe getting back to um, Niv's question about what's changed um, in the uranium market um, over the last year. I think um, there's actually been some some huge developments over the last, you know, circa 18 months in the uranium space. In my mind, what sort of kicked it off um, around mid 2020, 20, 2021 was um, when UPC was uh, reorganized into the uh, Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. And at that point, uh, uh, Sput started to buy up um, tons in the spot market, which is a thinly traded market already. And you started to see the spot price for yellow cake increase uh, materially. Um, I think it went up from something like $20 a pound all the way up to at its peak in above 60 and now it started to sort of come off and consolidate itself back around $50 a pound. But that um, brought a lot of uh, institutional um, focus back into the space, I think. And on the back of that, um, you saw some, some you know, really good um, price action and, and stock market performance for a lot of the uranium names globally. That was in the context of uh, Europe started to go through an energy crisis as well, and then that was just exacerbated by the uh, the tragic you know, Russian war in Ukraine, which caused a lot of government focus globally around back onto energy security, and in particular energy security that didn't uh, jeopardise the decarbonisation agenda, which is still a hugely important thematic that sort of something that grows every week and that our investors um, into our funds are, are you know, getting more and more focused on um, every day. So I think that then brought uh, a lot of you know, government um, political policy announcements on the back of it. And 2022 was a huge year for, um, for policy support from a political perspective. Um, you know, there's been countless um, announcements from different jurisdictions in, from Europe to Japan to South Korea and others um, promoting uh, nuclear energy, um, in particular, you know, promoting uh, expansions to the useful lives for the existing reactors. You've, you've seen a bunch of announcements in um, Europe around that. Um, then at the same time, you've had other sort of um, policy frameworks as well that have been beneficial. So you've had the EU um, taxonomy uh, announcement, including nuclear as um, a green fuel for um, tax incentive purposes. You had the IRA Act in um, the USA, which is you know promoting um, tax benefits as well as 
promoting um, Hallyu production to for Western, you know, utilities to eventually wean themselves off Russian um, conversion or enrichment capacity. So there's been, you know, a, a bunch of things that have happened from a political context that have been supportive. At the same time as you've had China uh, and other jurisdictions starting to announce, uh, you know, new, the construction of new reactors as well. Um, others might know exact numbers better than me on this call, but I think they're currently constructing about 18 at the moment um, in China, and they've they've committed to about 150 additional uh, reactors over the next uh, to the end of the decade. So, um, you know, that, that's what's happened from a um, political framework perspective. And then you overlay that with the fact that um, the macro looks quite good um, for uranium still. You've got uh, the spot price at $50 a pound, but you've seen conversion and enrichment in prices increase materially as their sort of bottlenecks in the supply chain. And um, the $50 a pound will just sort of, initially discussing this before we jumped on the call quickly, but that is a price where you, you need 50 to $60 a pound for cost support for these rest, you know, brownfield restart projects to actually generate a positive return on capital employed that they're comfortable with. And you probably need even a higher place from a bottom up supply and a higher price from a bottom up supply and demand perspective for the greenfield developers, maybe even higher again for um, the explorers. Um, and so you know the 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 macro backdrop um, is supportive when you've got a big supply deficit and cost support such that you can it's quite easy for an institutional investor to sit there and go okay I get the macro I get why a spot price can go from fifty dollars a pound still to eighty dollars a pound um, whereas you contrast that to what's happening in the lithium space at the moment where you've got spodumene and chemical prices way higher because of you know a, a short term structural supply deficit way higher than what cost support indicates. And so those prices could come down materially. And so, yeah, I think the, there's multiple factors as to why there's been, you know, uranium is back on the agenda in a big way. Um, and now we're kind of moving into this sort of consolidation period where the spot price has been consolidating itself. The markets become more vol volatile and weaker broadly because of geopolitical factors. And so we're kind of in this um, sort of twilight zone now. I think where um, where we need to see what happens to the macro next, but um, I suspect we could be in for a uh, for another um, you know leg up in the spot price. Mm -hmm. James, really well said. And and just sort of how, how do you see valuations in in the space? And and also um, how do you see the uranium playing a position in your own portfolio uh, at the moment? Um, yeah, so uh, we have exposure to um, a lot of the listed uh, uranium equities. From a valuation perspective, I sort of think about them in discrete buckets. You've got the existing big producers in Cameco and Kazatomprom, but on, from an ASX perspective, we don't yet have any pure play producers, but there are a number of um, brownfield restart projects like Paladin and Boss Energy and um, Peninsula. From a valuation perspective, I think about all of those on a DCF basis. Almost all of them have a, uh, you know, they they put um, MPV analysis into their feasibility studies. Um, and except for Paladin is the only one I think at this point that that hasn't put out MPV numbers. Um, and so I think about them, you know, I utilize those points to begin with, and then build my own bottom up um, DCF models and think about them on an implied uranium price basis so what's the uranium price you have to assume in your model to get to the current share price and so some entities might be implying 90 dollars a pound some entities might be implying 50 dollars a pound uh, into their existing share price and obviously the preference is to have exposure to those entities with a lower implied uranium price particularly if they still have market-based pricing offtake structures you know, you'd prefer to be exposed to someone with uh, implying a low uranium price with market-based pricing offtake contract structures compared to someone implying a you know a high uranium price who may have already locked in um, offtake agreements at forty or fifty dollars a pound. So yeah, that that's next one bucket. The next bucket is the brownfield developers. You start to think about them on a multiples basis if they don't have DCF analysis or if they haven't done a feasibility study yet. 
Um, and then you move down into the explorers. Again, um, I think about them probably on a multiples basis from a valuation perspective. And I think there is a sort of uh, actual correlation between project economics and the multiples that some of these entities trade on, right? So you've got next gen mm. over in the Athabasca Basin trades on a lot higher multiple than some of its early, um, you know, exploration um, peers or developer peers because because it's got very low unit costs and and potentially low capital intensity and, and huge grades. And so um, you kind of start to look at the multiples in the context of their project economics as well. And then you've got a few yeah. other categories, you know, Silex is in a technology bucket. Um, and then you've got the physical, um, the physical trusts like the Sput and uh, Yellow Cake. And mm. the way that fund managers, some fund managers think about it, and, and a, a portion that I talk to about this space who, who have exposure to it is you can use Sput, Sprot Uranium Trust as a kind of commodity um, price hedge to reduce your beta to the, to the sector if you want to. Um, and it offers a lot of liquidity. So you can often use it as a tool to sort of uh, re-lever or unlever diggy your portfolio if you need to. Or you can just use it as a tool to gain exposure to the uranium price if you think the uranium price is going to double. So yeah, that's yeah. the way I think about it. We've got obviously positions in our portfolio. Like I said, you know, the market's going down, the um, the, the spot price is um, is sort of going sideways and consolidating itself. But we're in a period where Sput's still buying, inventories have come down, Cameco's almost finished contracting MacArthur River. Um, mm. There's a supply deficit. So, um, you know, it's an interesting point in the cycle as to whether or not you want to have um, fundamental exposure to space. Yeah, and, and, the, and the ETF increased the last three trading days along with the market, so it is a good sign. Um, so, James, be, before we, we turn to the to the broader panel, um, the latest um, IE. Uh, World Energy Outlook report um, has nuclear power generation more than doubling uh, by 2050 under the net zero emission scenario. Um, do you agree that nuclear power is a good energy source to support the whole decarbonisation of our energy system? I know it's a big question, but maybe sort of your views in a few minutes. Yep. Um, I'd be interested to hear about others on the panel on this question as well, but I think the easy, the the net net answer is yes, definitely. It should mm. play a role in the decarbonisation um, of our global energy system. Um, there's obviously big positives with um, utilising nuclear fuel in the energy system. There's some rebuttal points. So maybe I'll talk about those as well, because you know, from our perspective, from a fund manager's perspective, it's often just as important, if not more important, to talk about the rebuttal points and why those rebuttal points might be wrong in terms of validating your thesis or not. But... Um, yeah, from my perspective, you know, nuclear power provides um, base load firming capacity to support the build out of renewable energy, especially as you've got coal fired power stations coming out of the system that's already happening. Um, for example, it's happening in Australia right now. Liddell is coming out of the system soon. Um, it offers high energy density. So, specifically for those countries that don't have the luxury of space, um, countries like Japan and, and um, Western Europe. Um, those are all the countries in, uh, are the ones that are announcing life extensions for their existing reactors. Um, so it provides you know high energy density. That's different to Australia, obviously, because Australia has huge land mass and um, and an abundance of wind and solar um, radiance. Um, and then no matter what, no matter what sort of energy transition report you read, almost every single one of them comes to the conclusion that. Um, you're going to need all forms of technology um, to of carbon abatement technology if we are genuine um, about you know decreasing global warming to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels consistent with the Paris Agreement, mm. um, and that includes nuclear in that framework, right? And then so those are the positive points. The rebuttal points I get when I talk to experts and people about this in Australia is capital intensity. Um, so, so the levelized cost of energy is actually costs a lot because of the scale and size for conventional reactors, um, such that their levelized cost of energy is higher than um, renewable energy. Um, that argument doesn't um, stand up for life extensions, um, and it also doesn't stand up for SMRs, where um, you know you could um, they're mo they're modular in nature and they use the same technology as conventional reactors, but just with higher enrichment. Um, level so you can put them on sites potentially 
like coal-fired power station sites that are getting shut down, and then you don't have to also build out a transmission and distribution network um, because you can scale them appropriately such that um, they're appropriate for that site. Um, and then the, the, the counter rebuttal to that is SMRs potentially good, they're potentially game changers, but you know, we also need solutions right now to um, the, the issues around greenhouse gas emissions mm. globally. Um, and then the final point is obviously just, you know, timeline to development and community support. And I'm interested to hear what others think, but when I, I, I think there is starting to be an additional discussion in Australia around nuclear energy, and you've seen some politicians start to talk about it positively. AUKUS is also sort of reigniting um, the debate a little bit. But at the same time, I do think there is, you know, it's kind of still this rhetoric of not in my backyard for nuclear um, power itself. That certainly doesn't mean the upstream um, can't be promoted and progressed, but um, those are probably the rebuttal points as to, mm. you know, nuclear power more broadly. Brilliant. Well, thank you for that, James and Niv. I might just jump into the actual panel now. So with uranium production being an important part of the African economy, with Niger, Namibia and South Africa producing approximately 18% of the world's annual production, both Elevate and Energy's projects have the significant potential to further contribute to this. So Mari, I might kick off with you first. So Elevate has projects in both Namibia and Australia. So can you give us a little bit more of an overview on these projects? Yeah, thanks, Jane, and uh, thanks for uh, having me here. Look, uh, Elevate's uh, the only um, ASX company with uranium in their name. Uh, so we're very proud of being in the uranium industry. Uh, we're very uranium focused. We're not uh, distracted by anything else uh, that uh, might come along and be the, the hot commodity of the time. But uh, yeah, we're ge ge geographically diverse. Namibia and Australia, two great countries, two of the you know, top four producers in the world of uranium. In Namibia, we've got 81 million pound of resources in Australia, 48 million pound. We've got the largest tenement for nuclear, sorry, largest tenement position for nuclear fuels in Namibia. And uh, we've been actively exploring on that with four discoveries in the last three years. So a pretty exciting time for us. Uh, we've got two druids working on the Coppies project at the moment. We've got another druid coming on the way to support uh, our recent discoveries. And we've got an expanding team of geologists. So uh, we're in a great position, Jane, to uh, ride this um, this uh, price rise that um, James was alluding to before. Thank you, Murray. And just on the African assets then, so how do you find operating in Namibia? Great, great, great people. Uh, infrastructure is fantastic. Uh, roads, uh, port, rail, um, international airport just uh, near our projects, a supportive government, um, you know, and the other thing is Rossing Uranium Mine have been operating since 1976. So it's 46 years, 47 now this year of continuous operating. So there's at least two generations of Namibians familiar with uranium mining. And I think that's that's important. And some of the points that James made before about acceptance um, you know, of nuclear, but acceptance of uranium mining, uh, I think is, is pretty good. And they're the fourth largest producer in the world. Murray, you just touched on it slightly there, but um, Namibia is an important jurisdiction for uranium with several big players in the country. So can you give us a little bit of background on sort of who's there and some more information on the scale of the projects that you've got there? Yeah, so Rossing, as I alluded to before, they're about a 12 million pound per annum uh, design capacity, uh, running a bit below that now because their grades dropped over time. Uh, they were mostly Rio Tinto owned, now Chinese owned. Uh, the HUSAB project, um, the same size, um, production uh, predominantly owned by another Chinese group. Langer Heinrich um, Paladin's project in care and maintenance, uh, that's about half the capacity of those, about six million pound. And then Arano, the big French um, uh, nuclear company, uh, have got uh, the Tricopy project in care and maintenance, but it's built at about 36 million tonne per annum heap leach operation. So four reasonably uh, well-sized mines, and there's a heap of, uh, I think there's three other companies, uh, ASX listed companies other than ourselves with uh, large resource bases. So there's a lot of activity in country. And one thing I didn't mention before, Namibia is the only country in the world with a dedicated Namibian Uranium Association. So that's dedicated to producers um, and explorers and is the conduit between us and, and government and uh, stakeholders and public. So fantastic place to be. Murray, you did touch on this earlier, but the company recently commenced an exciting 2023 drill campaign in Namibia. So can you just provide a quick overview of the company's campaign and what it aims to achieve? Yeah, well, in the first three years of uh, tenure of the Coppies project, we had a, a maiden resource on that. So we're now putting, we've got two drill rigs working full time on that uh, to expand that resource. We're drilling over 20 kilometres of strike 
So that's going to take a fair uh, period of time to uh, drill that out. Uh, and we're bringing this third rig in uh, to do it regional exploration and supporting it. But going back to copies, I mean, we've got average depth of about 25 metres a hole. We're drilling about 40 to 50 holes per week. Uh, and when you look at these two other um, explorers on Athabasca Basin areas, you know, one hole takes a long time. We're drilling, uh, we're drilling, um, you know, 40 to 50 a week. So a huge amount of holes, but we've got a large area to drill over. So uh, yeah, a lot happening from that perspective. Thanks, Murray. And can you tell us a little bit more about the company's wholly owned patented beneficiation process upgrade? Are they hard words, aren't they? Painted and, <laughs> and beneficiation. Uh, it's it's a fantastic process. It developed, we, we developed in-house, as you say, it's patented around the world in various jurisdictions. It's it's a uh, beneficiation process that uses commonly used general operations, but configured in an unconventional manner. It, it's targeted on sufficient uranium ores, uh, and it reduces the mass to be least to less than five percent. So what that means is it it gives us optionality. So we can take a concentrate, we could take it to Rossing, for instance. Uh, and they could leach and refine it, or we could leach and refine that concentrate on site ourselves, depending on the size of the project we've got to apply it to. So that gives us the optionality. So we can develop smaller or lower grade projects than our peers, but the key is it reduces the cost, capital and operating by about 50%. So it's a, it's a groundbreaking for us, and it's really the catalyst for us to grow our company. But uh, yeah, exciting again. And then just finally, so what news flow can shareholders look forward to over the coming months? Yeah, look, the copy is drilling. Uh, it's infield drilling. It's resource drilling. Um, so we're going to be announcing bits and pieces along the way on that, uh, and we're looking about how we can sort of, uh, sort of maybe stagger the resource um, upgrades on that. Uh, but being over twenty kilometres, uh, we're not too sure how we're doing that. So we're sort of looking around that, and this third drill rig on regional exploration, both on projects that we haven't drilled on yet, uh, but also projects that we have uh, discovered uranium and expanding those. So mostly around expiration of, uh, you know, all those three rigs working away. Thank you for that, Murray. So uh, on to the Agadez Uranium project. Uh, so Caroline, can you please provide a short overview of the project, as well as the current resource and exploration strategy? Thanks, James. Thank you, everyone, for having me here. We're really proud of our Agadez Uranium project, which we acquired in May last year. This project fits in perfectly with our strategy to be part of an industry that supports clean energy and decarbonisation. We have a large tenement package. It covers an area of around 726 kilometres squared, and it's situated in Niger's Timisoy Basin, which is widely renowned for being highly prolific for uranium. Our uranium assets host similar geology to the Urano mines that have been operating and producing uranium in that basin for at least 50 years. We also host similar geology to the significant deposits that are owned by Toronto listed Global Atomic and uh, Gobiex, who are both companies that are on the verge of development. We really like our Agadez assets because there's been already a significant amount of work that's been done on the ground. It was 24,000 metres of drilling before we even started. And in 2010, a historic shallow in third mineral resource was announced at Tarkadi, albeit under JORP 2004. Last year, we updated it. So now we have a, a JORP resource under JORP 2012. We have an expiration target of between 90 and 130 million pounds with U308. And we're expecting to see grades of between 300 and 400 parts per million. Um, with intersections of between two and five metres. To test our exploration target, also to identify new areas of mineralisation across our tenements, and also to extend our targeting deposit, we've also identified or developed uh, a, a 20,000 metre drilling program. It's a shallow drilling program of around 50 metres deep average uh, for 379 holes, which we plan to implement in phases. Thank you, Caroline. You did touch on this just briefly now, but the company is expecting to announce an updated Jork resource uh, imminently, actually. So can you tell us a little bit about the company's existing uranium resource and the anticipated upgrade? So last year, we were able to acquire some historical uh, exploration data on the Agadez project. And that meant that we were able to save a lot of time, effort and money in redoing work that had already been done. 
So with this, we were able to update that historical resource at targeted. So we currently have a shallow inferred mineral resource of 10.7 million pounds at a grade of 295 parts per million at a cutoff of 150 ppm. Two weeks after we acquired the Agadez project, we had the drillers on the ground and we completed an 11 week 5,500 metre drilling program. It was a shallow drilling program and it was focused in and around our targeted resource. The average depth of the drilling program was 50 metres and we found that mineralisation has was sitting from surface down to a depth of around 40 metres. Our mineralisation remains open in multiple directions and also at depth. The highest grades that we saw came from three holes uh, uh, around 1,100 to 2,200 parts per million with two metre intersections. And following this drilling program and also the results of the diamond core assays, which, which validated our downhole logging results, we will be looking to update our targeted resource shortly. Thank you, Caroline. So you recently announced some outstanding rock chip samples. Can you tell us a little bit more about this program and the results? So last year, at the same time as we undertook our drilling campaign, we did a rock chip sampling program. And as you said, our results were outstanding. 90% of the 89 samples that we took had grades of above 500 parts per million. Five uh, samples had grades above 10,000 parts per million, and two of the highest grades had 260,000 parts per million and 340,000 parts per million. So that's 26 and 34% respectively. For us, what this does is it confirms what we already knew, that there's mineralization throughout our tenements, but more importantly, it supports our really strong belief that we'll be able to find more pounds in the ground and also at a higher grade. Thank you for that, Caroline. So we know that you're exploring for uranium in Niger and copper in Botswana, in fact. So you're two very, you are two are very familiar in operating in Africa. Can you tell us a little bit more about Niger as a uranium mining jurisdiction? Well, if you're going to be mining for uranium, you want to be in a ju jurisdiction that already has a regularly rate. Sorry, I think I'm also, also getting tongue tied today. Um, already has a regulatory regime in place that allows you to export the materials. So as I've said, Niger has been producing uranium for at least 50 years, and it's one of the largest producers of uranium globally. In 2021, it was the seventh largest producer. Prior to that, it was the fifth largest producer. So it's not surprising then against this background that you have a strong mining culture in the region. You have a trained workforce, you've got the infrastructure in place. Um, we actually have the uh, uranium highway passing through our tenements, which is a good thing. Um, we also have a very a strong government who is supportive of foreign investment into the country. And so we've had a benefit of a really good relationship with, uh, with the government. Um, we also take comfort in the fact that Global Atomic and Gobiex, who are Toronto listed and who've been operating very successfully in the jurisdiction, who have large market caps, have been there and doing really, really well. Thanks, Carolyn. Just finally, so what should shareholders look forward to over the next three to six months? Sure. Well, we're really focused on developing our assets strategically. And so over the next little while, we, we will be looking to update the resource at Tarkadi, as we've already discussed. We'll be releasing the Botswana IP survey results for our copper assets, which are in the Kalahari Copper Belt um, in Botswana. We will be expecting to announce the grant of the Ekazan permit in near future, in the near future, which is a strategic part of the land package that we've made applications for with government in Niger. And we'll be looking to announce the commencement of a drilling program and further or oh, drilling program in Niger and further exploration work in Niger in Botswana. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that. Niv, I might just hand over to you now to, uh, to talk about the Athabasca Basin. Yeah, so um, Jane, thanks for, for that. Um, over, I mean, important part of the, the uranium jurisdiction, as you mentioned, the Athabasca Basin in Quebec. I mean, Canada uh, has, a, has a huge history, I think it's 70 years in the uranium production and, and being the second largest uh, producer after Kazakhstan. So, so Andrew, um, can you please tell us more about um, the region and, and also more specifically about Terra Uranium's projects? 
Yeah, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Terry Uranium is based in the Athabasca, and as I mentioned, Niv, that's the uh, premier uranium producing province in the world. Uh, I guess it really stands out because of the uh, quality of the deposits that are mined there, and particularly the grades. Uh, we have operating mines that uh, are running around 10 and 20% uranium, uh, producing from the unconformity at the base of the Athabasca Basin. And, and of course, Arrows Project, which is in development, it's slightly lower grade, but it is outside the basin. Uh, more importantly, we have three permitted and operating mills, uh, which can process ore not only from their own deposits, for, from other deposits in the area. And that was one of the reasons, one of the key reasons we chose the area. We had to be within proximity uh, to a processing facility. Uh, they can take 10 years or more to permit. Um, and, and it, that's a very long process. So we wanted something, uh, as, you know, a province that we could produce from in relatively short uh, time. And of course, it's in North America. And, and that's one of the major growth markets for uh, both uh, conventional reactors and the new small modular reactors. So we're right in the right in the center of everything there. Andrew, um, you, you've recently announced uh, a commencement of a hundred hole uh, RC drill campaign. Can you tell us more about the program and, and really what, what it aims to achieve? Yeah, we're, we're looking a little deeper in the Athabasca. We're a little bit west of the uh, the other operating mines uh, like MacArthur and um, uh, Cigar Lake. Uh, the uh, Because of the thickness of the sandstone, we need to do, test the sandstone in the surface. Uh, so we're using that with a shallow RC program. The area has been heavily glaciated. Uh, so we so we have between 10 and 30 metres of glacial cover. Uh, we need to get through that to look at the sandstone underneath. Uh, major uh, mineralisation systems that, of the type that we're looking for, and we are talking of projects that in the hundreds of millions of pounds, have extremely strong alteration uh, systems above them into the sandstone. So we view the thickness of the sandstone as in fact a, a, a bonus for us because those alteration patterns are, are uh, preserved in the sandstones. And uh, even at uh, eight or 900 metres above, we can still see evidence of the matte surface. Uh, and that's what the RC holes are doing. So we're, we're averaging around 40 odd metres and 25 metres into sandstone. Um, that winter program has now been completed. We've done 30 odd holes. Uh, we're getting uh, signs of mineralisation in a number of those. And uh, about six of those we're putting in helium detectors. Right. Um, that's interesting. I mean, what, what is the significance of, of a high helium result? Um, and can you, can you explain the relevance in terms of linking to, to the uranium? Yeah, I, I, we're, looking at, we're looking for um, mineralization well above the main ore body. Uh, and the Athabasca deposits being such high grade, uh, you know, when you're talking deposits 20, 30, 40 percent uranium and hundreds of millions of pounds uh, in a very small space, these are these are these are very intense systems. So one of the daughter products that's produced from that is helium. Uh, it's mm -hmm. the only way you can produce helium. Uh, Saskatchewan is actually one of the major producers of it in the world as, as a product. A, a lot of people don't realise that you can't make helium. You actually mine it, and uh, we're looking for traces of that at surface being given off by these very large and very high grade deposits. Um, we're using we're working with Tom Kotzer from the um, uh, University of Ottawa. He's one of the world experts in this, and we've developed their own uh, system for uh, collecting that and sending it off assay. They've been collected. Uh, we're expecting results probably in the next couple of weeks. That's great. And, and Andrew, can you please elaborate also on the importance of Canada's uranium sector in securing domestic supply of this critical commodity in North America? Yeah, it, it Canada is 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 obviously. Uh, well into uranium they've been mining it producing it and have around 20 percent of their uh, generated capacity is already nuclear um cameco is a major player in that space it, it was formerly state-owned it's now privatized listed on tsx uh, but they've moved upstream now uh, having uh, merged with westinghouse to produce uh, large reactors we see that that is a good example around the world of uh, how people should be doing things including australia uh, I think, as uh, James mentioned earlier, that it's necessary to stabilise a grid, even if you're running off solar and wind and other things, you need base load. And uh, being able to uh, produce right in the centre of that market is a, is a big plus for us. Mm. The, you know, the destabilisation in Central Asia and the war in Ukraine. Kazakhstan is a big producer, but having trouble getting the product out of the country. 
Um, most of it at the moment is going to China. Uh, mm. So the US government took the decision to have a reserve fund. They put a floor price of $50 a pound US on uranium from domestic production from North America. That includes Canada. Um, so we see MacArthur River restarting, which is the, one of the major mines that's been on care maintenance. Uh, two of the three mills are running again and it's ramping up. And uh, we know that if uh, we have product, we will have somewhere to treat it. So not very far away. So it's, it's moving. And I, and I might just, in, in that vein, just pick up something James was talking about, which is the development of um, small modular reactors. I, mm -hmm. I think this is only very, very early stage. And it's the thing that will have a major impact on the whole nuclear industry because we're talking reactors around uh, 150 to 200 uh, megawatts. Uh, these have the capacity to replace the coal-fired power stations we have today. And, and, there, and there have been uh, recent developments uh, uh, on, in that front, particularly in Canada. And uh, in other words, up, upgrading the uh, power output from a small modular reactor to a level that can actually drive a turbine in a coal power station. So that this is relatively early stage. The first ones are being built right now. Uh, patents are being taken out. Uh, we're a few years away from this having a big impact, but it will. So, so you know, it's going to have an enormous, and all those need uranium supply, and and it's and it's limited. Um, so. We feel we're in the right right jurisdiction and we're right at the early start of this growth curve. And I just, that's really interesting. I mean, obviously we're big supporters. You've got an exceptional team with Troy Bajoli, who was 2IC Next Gen. You've got yep. Mike McClellan, who used to run Cameco's, all of the operations yourself, Kylie and, and the team. I mean, what, what as shareholders can we expect over the next three to six months? Because it is an exciting part. You've completed the drilling. You're, you're about to kick off a a diamond drill campaign, uh, which is really exciting, uh, you know, post that VTEM and ZTEM um, results that you received. So can you tell us a little bit as shareholders what to expect? Yeah, that, that's right, Niv. And uh, as we're deep, as we're, the holes are relatively deep, they're a thousand metres, um, we need to make sure that we locate them as best as possible. So we've done that now. We've done, we've brought ANT, which is passive seismic technology from Australia to be able to map the base of the unconformity, worked extremely well. Um, we, we'll, we've mobilised the diamond rig in, so it's still winter there. Uh, it's very important mm. to uh, keep costs under control by moving as much across the ice as we can before it melts. The diamond rig's been moved in, the rods, the fuel, the, the greases, everything else ready to go. Uh, we'll be drilling our first hole uh, quite soon, um, May, June, that sort of period, our first diamond hole on our first target, which is Parker Lake. Um, extremely strong conductor at the unconformity from our Z10 program. Mm. Uh, it was an old project that had been around for a long time. Uh, the data was 20 odd years old and our new Z10 showed an extremely strong conductor, as strong as MacArthur River, if not better. It doesn't mean there's uranium there, uh, it, but it means we're in the ballpark. Uh, we've got the conductor. We need to drill those holes. We've got the rig on site. So over the next few months, uh, that rig will be running. Um, and we'll uh, be looking forward to uh, putting results out to the market. Mm. Very exciting. Um, and now just on, on to the general uh, uranium market. Um, of course, over the past six months, we've seen a further change in sentiment uh, towards nuclear energy, partly driven by, as, as James said, the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust and, and further countries turning uh, towards uh, nuclear as a means of meeting uh, their ambitious zero carbon emission targets. Um, Murray, I might start here with you. I mean, where do you see uranium price going in the next you know, few months and, and years ahead? North. Oh, do you want more detail? Look, it's absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, we're all in that business, as Andrew just said, you know, we all believe it's going to go north. I listened to the comments that James made before, you know, decarbonisation is one thing, electrification. Without a baseload reliable energy source, you know, you can't have decarbonisation. You know, the, you mentioned here, the, you know, the other thing here was baseload supporting renewables. All due respect to renewables, but they don't cut the mustard, right? Mm. But last night, there was no wind blowing here and there was no sun shining. Batteries store energy, batteries discharge energy, batteries don't generate energy. We don't have batteries big enough, as, you know, there's, and we don't have enough uh, metals in the world to build enough batteries to supply what we need in terms of energy source. So there's, there's the the nuclear industry don't 
come out and say, we are the answer. The nuclear industry come out and say, we are part of the answer, right? As opposed to renewables coming out and say, we are the answer. Well, they're not the answer because they need a reliable um, support because they don't, you know, those, the wind and sun doesn't shine all the time. And as, as uh, James said, you know, some countries are limited in area. I mean, these things need, wind and solar need a huge area to, to go. But but getting that aside, um, you know, we better not bag, I better not bag renewables too much, but, you know, the supply demand argument, uh, James alluded to that as well. There's not enough supply uh, around to meet demand. Yeah. And demand is growing because the number of nuclear reactors being built and proposed and also the ones that with lives extended. So we know that the current supply is not increasing. Okay, MacArthur River is coming back on, but and Langer Heinrich are talking about coming back on, but they're not producing yet, right? So, and even when they do produce, we're still well short. I mean, we're 60 million pound a year short of where we need to be. So the only way to incentivize production is for the commodity price to rise. So if uranium price doesn't rise, well, none of us are going to be incentivized to produce. Mm. We can keep exploring if we can raise the money, but at the end of the day, the uranium price has to go up. And James alluded to 60 plus dollars a pound. Um, with the cost um, of everything rising now, uh, you expect that, you know, what he was saying offline before that, you know, as we're getting closer to 80, maybe to incentivize uh, new production. So really, I, I think uh, that the commodity price has to rise. Uh, the math is there. Uh, the story is there. There's, a, there's an acceptance, a, a growing acceptance for nuclear in this country. Um, and I say growing because it was starting from a very low base, right? And as you say, AUKUS has helped that and and uh, you know the the uh, a few others are talking about it at least, and that's that's a step in the right direction. But yeah, I'm I'm big on I'm big on uh, SMRs um, replacing uh, what we've got in terms of coal. Uh, but I think we really need to. I, I can't see it going anywhere else but north. It's not not possible yep. to go south. Yep. Yeah. And, and Caroline, over to you. Um, can you please explain also the importance that. Um, nuclear will, will play in general in the, in the general energy mix and 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 why it's uh, what is required to achieve decarbonisation i think everyone's already touched on it because it's such an important part of what we do is in the industry and to be honest i think a lot of us are part of this industry not because we only are supporting nuclear and we're saying these things because we're in the nuclear industry it's because we actually have a passion for you know where we want to be going forward since the 1990s, cumulatively, there's, there's been around 1.3 trillion tonnes of greenhouse gases that have been admitted into the atmosphere. In 2021, it was 50 billion tonnes released. So now we know that many countries, including Australia, have agreed to combat um, global warming by committing to net zero targets by 2050. And this necessarily involves an energy transition, which includes a greater reliance on renewable energy sources, especially solar and wind. And it also in involves that move away from the reliance on fossil fuels. So while we know that solar and wind will definitely indefinitely play an important role in the energy mix going forward, we also know that they have their limitations. Well, we've talked about some of them. You know, renewable energy technologies are mineral intensive. And as we increase our reliance on these energy sources, demand for critical minerals are going to soar. We've already started to see the impact of well, green inflation on certain commodity prices. And no doubt these increased costs are going to be flowed through to the end user. The cost of building infrastructure to take power from these scattered remote locations, which are going to be located in, you know, right across the country, um, right to the power grid, is also going to take a lot of financial investment and a whole bunch of planning. And a lot of that really hasn't been done yet. So mm. we also talked about energy security, and that's high on everyone's agenda. And the fact that 80% of the world's renewable energy technology comes from one source at the moment, and in this instance, it's China, we really have to question whether this kind of reliance is either wise or, or, or whether it's sustainable either. Um, solar and wind, they provide intermittent power, as we've talked about. So there are going to be those additional costs of backing up these systems when they're not producing. And what are we backing them up with? Because if we're moving away from solar, uh, if we're moving away from fossil fuels, fuels we don't have many other options. Um, and one of the things that we expect over here is that we have, oh, and obviously 
industry is dependent on it is that we have continuous low cost power. And other than hydro, which is completely dependent on environmental conditions, nuclear is really the only form of very low carbon energy that's able to provide low cost power on a 24 seven basis. And it's against that backdrop, you can understand why so many countries are now embracing or re-embracing nuclear um, as a critical part of their energy mix. We already know that nuclear provides 10% overall of the global energy requirements. Uh, we've talked about this already, but the footprint of the nuclear fuel plant is relatively small and operationally, you can just replace a coal fired plant and utilize all the existing infrastructure. So there's some cost savings that are associated with that. It's a known, it's a proven, it's a safe technology that's been used and improved since the 1950s. So, you know, that's another big important part of this whole energy transition as we're moving towards um, or, or looking for new ways of doing things, we've got something that is known and proven. And certainly mm -hmm. with the advancements in small modular reactors, the application of nuclear power is certainly going to become broader. Uh, and look, I, I think we really must have the discussion in Australia because we don't want to end up with our own energy crisis. And I don't think that it really is too far of a leap for us, especially as, as we've now adopted nuclear powered subs. And we're going to need a nuclear industry in Australia in order to support this. Yeah. And um, Andrew, over to you, just in terms of just off the record, came to, went to PDAC, you went to Saskatoon, you're on site. What's the mood there? in Canada um, and, and what can you tell us what's happening over there? Yeah, very, very positive, Nev. Um, the, um, uh, I think the move to nuclear is well and truly on. Prices are, prices are strong. Uh, we're hearing of uh, uh, forward sales being done over $60, around $62, $63 a pound um, uh, to lock in production. That, that's actually contracts being done now. I agree with the comment uh, I think Murray made about about eighty dollars being a being a trigger point. I think that's certainly the case. There are a lot of projects that will come on stream at eighty. Um, but there's a lot of interest and a lot of support, and it's it's um and it's just going to grow. as I said, I, I, I'm a strong believer in SMRs and and we haven't started yet. It, if you take an analogy of, of Tesla cars, you know they they took them a long time to build the first one. But once the production line starts, that they, they, they uh, start coming out. And that's what's going to happen with SMRs. We haven't really started that yet. And they need to be fueled. And, and at, at, uh, the, the, the cost of the uranium fuel is a very minor part of the total process. So, so when we're looking at um, our product and how that feeds into the total cost of generating power, it's a fraction. It's only a few percent of the total amount. So whether they pay $68, $100 a pound, doesn't affect the cost of production hardly at all. So I see a lot of upside up and, and, and limited supply. Well, thank you, everybody. I want to thank, um, thank you all for your time today. And I want to thank our panelists for joining us. A copy of today's recording will be available on YouTube, the attending company's websites, and on social media in the coming days. But I want to thank you all again.